Hi everybody, Scott Stanchfield here. Let's take a look at some of our Compose basics in an actual application. Now to do this, I've started in Android Studio by saying File New, and I'm choosing a new project. I'm going to choose this Empty Compose Activity as my starting point. And let me call this one Compose Basics. I'm going to put that into our course repository. We'll say Finish. Let that index there. And I'm going to switch over here instead of the Android view, go to the Projects view, which I prefer. And I've got to remember to switch my color scheme to the class color scheme, which boosts the font. Yay! That's what happens when I do actual work on this computer. When I use a smaller font so I can actually see more, it isn't quite as visible to everybody watching. So poof, bigger font. Yay! So what we're going to do is take a look at how some data gets passed in the user interface and how we can display things. To start with, let's start simple. Inside my on create here, I'm going to create a var name equals Scott. We're just going to have a nice little variable here that we're going to use to present data inside of a text. Now right now it's got this sample greeting here. I'm just going to get rid of this guy. I'll just rename him. No, I'm going to get rid of him for right now. And we can get rid of that. I'm just going to comment him out, come back to him in a minute. And inside here, I'm just going to say text and pass in text equals name. One of the things that uh, people like to do a lot with Jetpack Compose, because a lot of these composable functions have a lot of parameters, is we like to use named parameters inside of them. And this is a great feature in Kotlin where you can just actually list the parameter name and then equal the value. And you can actually put them in any order you would like, which is also pretty useful, as well as a lot of the parameters may have default values. If we take a look at the definition of text, I'm going to control click on him. We're going to see there's a whole bunch of parameters in here, and a lot of the values have defaults, like on text layout uses an empty lambda. This text align has a null object, so it's going to use those as some default values. You know, text unit unspecified. It's it's just using the you know some dummy values for everything here, so that you don't have to specify everything every time, but can override the parts that you care about, such as the style. So right now I'm just going to put text equals name just to display that on the screen. And let's actually see what happens when I do that. I'm going to hit run using this Pixel 4 emulator. That's going to start the emulator up over here on the side. Depending on how you have it configured, the emulator might start up outside of Android Studio. And here's our application running, and we see Scott printed on the screen. If I change that text to Michael and rerun it, we'll see that the text changes to Michael on the screen. So what I'd like to be able to test here is if I click on that text, let me actually have it change. So I can do that by adding a clicker to this text. Well, let's do a little styling first before I get into that detail. Let's say that we want to put some spacing around this. I can use a modifier. By saying modifier padding 8.dp. I'm going to have to hit control space after dp to import it, or I could also use uh, alt enter. And if I run that, I should see some more space appear around that text. There we go. That looks a little bit more comfortable. Right now, that text is only taking up just this little bit of space up here in the top corner of the screen. If I wanted to have multiple texts, I could actually have multiple texts, but I need to put them in some kind of a layout so that I can have it space them out automatically for me. I'm going to choose a column. And by saying column here, that is going to, and again, I'm going to hit Alt Enter on him to import him. By saying column, it's going to have each of these one after another vertically. So if I say, make this one be dollar or x dollar name x something silly like that well i need to have curly braces in order to have that x on the end let's go ahead and run it and we should see michael showing up twice the second time surrounded by x's so that seems like that's working okay kind of as a basic setup there let's put a border around one of those so maybe for this guy here after i do the padding initially i want to have 
a border that I'm going to have be like 2DP. Let's bring him in. Um, is it DPs that he has? <coughs> and when I import him, let me choose the second one here. It has a DP and a color. Or the third one actually right here. So I'm going to say width equals 2DP and color equals color dot blue. Well, actually, instead of use hard coding a blue there, let's just use our style that we have from the theme. I'm going to use my primary color. So I'm just going to say material theme dot colors dot primary. And that's set up using this compose basics theme here. He sets up all those colors and defines a special type of object here called material theme that has the data into in it accessible to us. That, by the way, is known as a composition local, and it's being defined by this surface here. And you can define your own composition locals, which give you kind of a scoped object to hold things. I recommend you minimize that as much as possible because it kind of makes it look like magic's happening and makes things a little harder to test because you need to make sure that that value is available when you're doing your testing. It's much cleaner to just pass all your data in. But I'm going to give him a little border around things. And then let's put some padding in between the border and the actual content there. Let's run him, see how that looks. And now we can actually see the size of this thing a little bit more clearly. If I wanted it to actually stretch to fill out the whole width, I can add in a dot fill max width. And now if we see this, it's actually going to take up all the width of the space there with some padding, then a border, then some more padding, then the value. Now let's make this thing clickable. There's a real simple way to do it, and there's much more complex click support that'll let you do things like tracking drags and dealing with this something double click versus long clicked and all that. But your basic click, you can just say clickable, passing in a lambda, and then what to do when this guy's been clicked. So what I'd like to do is change this variable here. So let's say name equals Scott. And let's run him and see what happens. So there's my Michael up there. When I click on him, note that nothing is happening. It's not changing. And the reason there is that Jetpack Compose doesn't know how to watch for changes on this variable. So let's change this a little bit. Instead of name being just a name like that, let's have it be a mutable state of that string. And this is going to create a little bucket to hold on to things. But you'll notice we have a couple little problems here now. This text doesn't know how to take a mutable state as its parameter. So I'm going to have to say dot value there. Boom. And then down here, I'll have to say name dot value equals state. But this should work. It's a little bit awkward. We'll come up with a better way to deal with that in a minute. But let's run it. And we should see this actually work to change the state. So we'll click on this. Boom. We get Scott there. Now, the reason that you, you may have noticed as I was starting to change things here, this, this you actually did see Scott show up in the previous example. That's because as you're editing, it tries to update this live on the device. And so the, the edits are what triggered that, not actually the click itself. Now, you notice actually this uh, second one down here where it's trying to just say, take the name. It's actually saying name dot two string, which is printing out mutable state value equals Scott. Not quite what we want. So that really should be dot value as well. And we run it. We'll now see the two values showing up with Michael. And when I click on the first one, it's actually changed that. And both of them are updated automatically. Compose can watch these states and adapt and re-render themselves. It's, it's a process known as recomposition. But this is a little awkward having to say dot value all the time. So what we're going to want to do is say anytime we access name, delegate it to a get value on this guy. Anytime we see, we try to set the name, delegate it to a set value over here. And we do that by changing this to say by. This is initially going to be an error because the get value and set value functions that we need aren't yet imported. They're actually extension functions that they've defined on top of the state object. So the state object can stay pretty clean as just a data piece. 
it doesn't need to worry about Kotlin delegation. So what we're going to do is come up to our imports up here. And unfortunately, setting this guy up isn't super, super easy. You can come down here and do an Alt Enter and choose the Git value. Oh, actually, I think it did both of them, didn't it? So in order to, to set up that get value and set value, I click on here and I hit Alt Enter. And it's actually imported the get value for me. If I come up here and look again, and again I'm going to see there's now this Android X Compose Runtime get value has been imported. If I hit Alt Enter on him again, it's actually going to bring in the set value. So the combination of those two is actually satisfying the requirement of the property delegation. Anytime we reference name in a git function, <clears throat> anytime we reference name in a git context, it's going to delegate it to this guy's git value. Anytime we reference it in a set context, it's going to delegate it to that set value, which we just imported there. So now we don't actually have to use the dot value explicitly on here. We can just use name as though it is directly a string. And when I run that now, that should work. And the code's a little bit cleaner. So now we have those. Change Michael to Scott. Wonderful. Now let's say we want to make both of these text fields have the same kind of styling. They both have the border and the padding and all that. We could completely repeat this. And come in here. And then I'm going to change uh, this guy to... Oh, we'll just move this text guy up there. And I get rid of this last guy down here. So now we have them styled the same way. If I run it, we'll see them both show up with the borders around them. And then they both actually can be clicked and do that because they're both changing Scott. But that's kind of repeating yourself. And in programmers, it, <clears throat> and in programming, we like to adhere to the dry principle, otherwise known as don't repeat yourself. So what we'd like to do is create a function to help. And that's what's wonderful about Compose, is we can just take this commonality and put it into its own function. So I'm going to copy him. And let me actually create another file out here underneath uh, Compose Basics. I'm going to call it common.kt. And actually, I should have <clears throat> so I'm going to create a file here, new Kotlin class slash file. I'm going to call it common. I'm going to make it a file instead of a class because it's just going to have a collection of functions in it. And what I'm going to do is have a composable function here that I define. I'm going to call it fun common text, something like that. And we'll leave the parameters for a second there. And then we're just going to paste in that text that we had. Now let's take a look at the things we might want to change in this. We may want to change this name, and we may want to change what happens when we click it. So let's first of all pass in that name. I'm going to say name colon string. Note that that's immutable. It's not going to be something that can be changed. And on click is a function that takes no arguments and is just going to execute a body. It's not going to return anything. So we got the name taken care of there. For clickable, I'm going to say here on click, just like that. And one thing to be careful of here, the way I've referenced it, I actually had this problem in the previous example for the, the database where I forgot to put in paren paren because we actually want to call this as though it's a function. So when we click it, we're going to execute that on click. So now we have this common text field that's going to have all these characteristics of some padding and a box and some more padding. And now I can use that in my activity to simplify things quite a bit here. So I can say common text, name equals name. And actually, since there's that only one parameter I care about there, this other parameter being passed in, the last parameter, is that on click lambda. And the way that Kotlin works, if you have the last parameter to a function be a lambda, you can actually put that outside of the parentheses. 
you could still define it inside if you wanted to. So we could say on click equals and put the curly braces inside kind of like this. And in, in fact, if you had multiple lambdas, you'd have to do it this way. But if you only have a single lambda and it's the last one, I strongly recommend you just leave it outside of the parentheses. I think it's a little bit more clean to read. So we'll get rid of all that stuff. And since I only have one parameter, I'm just gonna go ahead and put it on the same line. And then inside here, what do we wanna do? I'm gonna say name equals Scott. And let's do that again for the second guy. Except instead of just name here, give myself a little more room. We wanted this to be x dollar name x. And now we should get the same type of behavior, but in a lot less code. So let's run this. And poof, now when I click on it, ta-da, everything works just great. So this is one of the big benefits of Compose is that you can define your own customizations of existing things by just making a function that sets all sorts of common values. It's so much easier than creating custom components in the old version of Android where you're dealing with views and you have to create subclasses and do all sorts of stuff. In here, you just call functions and pass different values. Now let's say we want to push this up a notch uh, and actually create a function to contain this little chunk of a body of code here. And what I'm going to do is instead of just using this name as we're doing, we'll create a little movie object and then use that to create a little form on the screen for it. So let's create a class here for the movie. I'm going to say data class movie. And inside there, I'm going to say val name string, actually title. Movies don't have names, they have titles. And then val description string. It's kind of like that. And I made this a data class so it gets that equals and hash code and two string for free, which is kind of nice. But now I have a couple pieces of data that I'm passing in and I want to create a, a, a nice little user interface to encapsulate the whole movie stuff on the screen. But I'm going to go ahead and use some of this common functionality like this common text there. So let's see what this might look like. I'll create a composable function. And this isn't really going to be a common thing, so I'm not putting it in that common file. The common stuff is going to be things like a common text field, a, a common label on the screen, uh, some list support we'll do later. We'll just kind of build up a common library of helper stuff. So inside here, let's do a fun movie display. And he's going to take a movie as an argument. And we're going to want to display something for that. We're going to have maybe some text to represent labels on the screen and some text to represent the actual values. So let's create a couple common helpers. We're not going to do the boxes and everything around there because unfortunately with these boxes, it kind of looks like that's an editable text field. And that's not what we're trying to do at this point. So in common here, let's, let's actually rename this one to be boxed text. Let's create a composable, I'm going to call it fun label. And we're going to have some text that goes on the label. And then we might want somebody to be able to pass a modifier in so that it can fill out a certain uh, um, form, a format on a, a bigger layout or something like that. So I'm going to say modifier, modifier, and you're going to want to do this on a lot of your composable functions so that people can combine this into a layout and pass in modifiers that actually take advantage of that layout, and how they resize things and how they do padding and things. So we'll pass that modifier in. And inside here, I want this label to just be a piece of text. He's going to have text equals text to start with and modifier equals modifier. But let's tweak that modifier a little bit. We want to add in that padding as well. So we can take the modifier that's passed to us and add padding to it. So I can say padding 8.dp. But maybe we also want to make this completely fill the width of the screen. So we can just put in a dot fill max width. And that might be something that's better to leave for the outside of this label, but I'm trying to set it up so that 
this will be a, a block of things where you can have a label and a text field right next to each other or a label and a display value right next, next to each other. So for now, we'll just say fill whatever the, the max size is of the parent. And I probably also want to have a style on this guy so that a label looks different than just a display. So I can say style equals material theme dot typography dot, let's call this one an H5. So we'll make it, actually make it an H6. So he'll be a little bit on the small side. And a comma there, and that should make everything else look good. So here's a pretty decent little label. Let's come in here and actually create a display text. It's gonna be kind of similar, but we'll make him be an H5. And what I'd like to also do is indent that a little bit. So let me add in here, instead of just having padding 8dp, I'm going to say padding start equals, let's say 16, well, I'll make it 24, make it a little bit bigger, 24dp, and then end equals 8.dp, and then top equals 8.dp, and bottom equals 8dp. So that'll make it indented a little bit nicer there. So we're defining a different style for each of these guys. The display is a little bit bigger than the label. But now that I'm looking at this, there's a lot of commonality between these two things. So what's, what's different between these? We got the style is different and the padding is a little bit different. So what we can do is set this thing up so that we create a common text behind this where we just pass in a style and a padding amount that we want to use for that leading pad. So let's do something like that. Come down in here. Let's create common text. And we're going to pass in the text. We're going to pass in the style. Let's see what that type of the style is there. It's of type text style. So I'm going to say style, text style. Did I import the right text style? No, I did a Java, Java time format. That's a bad thing. Be really careful on this because there's sometimes there's words that are the same in different APIs. So in this particular case, when I hit Control Enter, notice there's a Java time format and then the Android X Compose one. We really want to use the Compose one here, otherwise it's not going to work. And let's say start padding is going to be of type DP. And so now I can just replace this here with start padding and this with style. And now we can replace these guys. And since I only have a single expression, I'm going to use that equals format here. Let's say equals common text. And let's set these values. So modifier is modifier. We're just going to pass it right on through. Text is going to be the text coming in. Style is material theme, typography. And this was for the display, so it's the H5. And start padding is going to be 24.dp. So now I can do the same kind of thing for this guy up here. I make him an H6 and make that an 8dp to start with. And voila. So now the actual real thinking stuff happens down here. Now I didn't save myself a whole lot on this one. Um, but there's other ways we could have factored it that might have helped a little bit there. But uh, this, uh, you know, I like to reuse things where possible. So I have my label and my display. Let's use these inside of a user interface. So I'm going to come up to my main activity here, and we're going to have a column. And let's make this column actually fill the entire screen. So I'm going to say modifier dot fill max size. And then inside here for the column, I'm going to have a label where the text is going to be movie. Actually, this is going to be some literal text. We'll fix that up in a second here. So this literal text would be title. And then modifier here is going to be, actually I don't need any special modifier for this. So I can just pass in modifier like that. And it's going to start off with just a base modifier object there rather than having other details in it. Let's also have a description. And then I can say the actual text, this is going to be for a display. Text equals movie dot 
title and movie.description. Now notice I'm passing in modifier to all of the to all four of these functions. I could actually let that be a default and then only override it when I need to. So let's take a look at the label here. And we'll come into there and say modifier equals modifier. Just like that. And that gives us a default value, so we don't actually have to specify it. And that'll be passed down into the common text function. So now I can actually make this even cleaner by doing this. And I still have the flexibility to change the modifier if I ever want to change anything, like if I want to put a box around it, for example, or if I want to make it clickable. So let's try using this movie display someplace. Let's go into our user interface. And I'm going to create a movie the same way. Mutable state of, let's let's actually make this be a nullable movie. So to do that, I'm going to say movie question mark as the type in the mutable state. And I'm just going to pass in null to start with. Now this, we're going to see, is going to become a problem in a moment. But let's work our way through that problem. So now inside of our user interface, let's have a movie display. And we're going to say movie equals movie. And we're going to see right away here that Kotlin gives us an error. That's because Kotlin takes nullability dead serious as part of the language. When you tell it up here that this can be null, now we're saying this value is null. And if we look at movie display, he's not allowing us to have that movie be null. So I can do this a couple different ways. I can say only call movie display if the movie is not null or do something different in movie display if the movie is not defined. So it really kind of depends on how often you want to have that distinction and where you want to actually have the alternative. If you're always going to use the same alternative for a null movie, you probably want to put it inside here. If you're going to vary that based on if you have a movie or not, you're going to put it at the call site. Let's do it at the call site so we can see how that works. So up here, I'm going to say movie question mark dot let. And now the it value here is a non null movie because it's going to take a look at movie, and if it's not null, pass it as a receiver to let, and then let just passes that in as the first parameter to this lambda. So now I can come up here and say it. And now the movie display is getting a non-null movie, and then that should work just fine if it's not null. Now in order for this to work, of course, I'm going to have, I'm never going to see this movie if it's null. So what I'd like to do is when one of these guys gets clicked on, let me set the movie. So I'm going to say, if you click on this first one here, let's call this um, Jumanji. And then in here, actually, let's call that the sting. I want to use the sting. Um, we're going to have the movie is a movie with title is the sting. And description is con guys, con, non, con guys who think they're con guys. I guess that sums up the plot of this thing pretty well. I have no idea. I can't remember the movie very well other than there's con guys and it was actually really good. Um, let's say that this movie here is Superman. We'll say Superman. And we'll say Christopher Reeves flies. Yay. Okay, so what this should do for us, oh, I'm actually doing this in the wrong place. I want to actually have these be up here. Name equals the sting for that little box text and name equals Superman here. And I'm not actually changing this name variable. So I'm going to get rid of this name variable. We don't really need him. So let's see what happens when I run this. Now keep in mind initially that movie is null. So what I'm seeing here is I'm not seeing that movie displayed on the screen at all. Now if I click on the sting, now I'm seeing the user interface show the sting and this description here. But where did the other box text go? I kind of expected it to show up on there. And this is one of the problems when you actually have a modifier do the thinking for itself inside of a nested composable. Let's take a look at this movie display. Notice how this modifier says fill max size. 
what's actually happening here is the movie display is taking up all the size on the screen and then those two boxes are actually off screen below it. So what I'd really like to do is instead of having him take up the entire screen, let's just have him take up as much space as he needs. And I could say wrap content size, just like that, that would do it, but I believe that's the default. Let's see what happens when I run it. Hopefully we'll see what we expected the first time. Boom, and there's the buttons, and if I hit Superman, boom, it changes that. So now we're modifying our user interface very, very easily here. I am managing some data inside of it, which we want to get away from. And when we do the, the full-on movie example, we'll see that. So I'm pretty sure we can actually get rid of this modifier here and have the same effect. Let's just take a look. We'll hit the sting, and there we go. Hit Superman, there we go. So let's take a look at what's going on here as far as our composition and recomposition. Let's go to our set content, and I'm going to put a log.d inside there. And if I'm doing just temporary logging, one of the little tricks I like is just to put in three bangs for the tag. Uh, this is just some information that's put into the log, the, the log that's stored on Android. We can view that by losing the log cat here. And it makes it nice and easy to filter down to stuff that maybe I just care about. Now, sometimes they do use three exclamation marks other place, but not often do they use five. If you're leaving the logging in, I'd recommend you actually use the class name instead of some kind of bangs here. So the tag might look like this colon colon class dot simple name. And it'll just return the main activity for that as the tag. And that way you can filter down to just the stuff inside yours. But if you're just doing things for kind of a quick demonstration or a quick debugging, I'd recommend you throw this in and then delete that one later. So we're going to print that out. We're going to say set content called. And I'm going to do the same kind of thing in each of these guys. So compose basics theme. His body is getting called. And then surface. And then inside there, column. And then Let's go ahead and put this inside of the actual box text because it's actually a function being called here. So we'll say box text being called. And then we can do something similar with our common text. And our, I guess common text is fine there. Um, let's actually with common text, let's say text equals dollar text, just so we can actually see which ones are being updated when we do things. Now, what I'm trying to accomplish here is see what is actually getting run every time something is recomposed. The, ideally, the entire GUI shouldn't have to refresh every time. It should only refresh subtrees that need to be refreshed. So let's take a look at that. Let's run it. So let's take a look at our log cat and look for boom, 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 boom. And sometimes it takes a little while to load the log cat. There we go. Um, that's interesting. So show selected application. I guess it just hadn't refreshed the log cat there. Android Studio, you're awful sometimes. So you see we called set content, compose basic theme, surface, column, box text, box text. So those are the pieces that were being called. I really should have for the box text, put one um, with the text as well, just so we can see it. Name equals dollar name. I'll just make it a little bit easier to see what's actually getting refreshed there. And so now we'll see box text, the sting, and Superman was called. Now let's see what actually happens when we hit this button. I'm going to hit the sting. Let's see what got refreshed. So when I hit the sting, surface, column, 
and then these common texts got updated. Note that the box text didn't get called again, but now I have the common text in the column and all that type of stuff. Let's see what happens if I click Superman. So now surface, column, and the common texts. So it didn't, I forgot my parenthesis there, but it didn't actually have to refresh the box texts on these because the parameters didn't change for them. And this is really nice because it can really optimize the way the user interface is being uh, managed. Now, if we go back and take a look at movie display, I forgot to put a log in there. Let's put that in. We should see that one actually being called too. So say movie displayed for dollar movie called. And because he is a data class, he has a two string built into him. Let's see what that looks like. So when we first run, we see the box text showing up there. Let's hit the sting. And now we get the common text title, the sting, description, con guys, yada, yada, yada. And let's hit the Superman. And notice that we're not doing those two labels because the value hasn't changed. We're just putting out the common text on there and there's the movie. So it's optimizing away some of the refreshes that are need to be done and makes things much, much faster that way. Now you may ask why the surface and the column are actually being recalled. And that's because we're actually adding new elements inside of the user interface that are needed to be laid out inside the column and the surface. So it's actually needs to refresh those in order to deal with having a different number of elements underneath them. Now let's set up a little list of movies here that we can change. And let me get him out of the way and get him out of the way for the moment. And let's come in here and say var movies equals list of movie. And I'm just going to shrink the movie titles down a little bit here. So we'll just say title one and description one, just so I don't have to type a whole bunch of stuff there. We'll put in a couple others here, two, three, four, two, three, four. And let's display those movies in a, in a column. Now, this is not a good way to do this. We should be using something called a lazy column, which I'll get to in a little bit. But just for this quick demonstration, we'll display them as a list, in, in a list of things inside a column. So let's come into, let's say at composable, fun movie list. And we will have movies, list of movie. And then inside here, I'm gonna have a column of movies for each. And then we'll display the movie data inside there. So we'll say movie display, movie equals it, just like that. So we're gonna have sub displays inside there. Now what I might wanna do is box each of these movies up so that it's a little bit cleaner, some separation between them. So what I could do is just put literally a box around this, which is a very simple component inside Jetpack Compose. It lets you put decorations around things. You can also use it as a type of a layout and position things in the corners. Uh, but I'm gonna say modifier equals modifier dot uh, border width equals 2.dp, color equals color dot, let's go with blue. We'll just be explicitly blue. And we probably want a little padding, both outside and inside it. So we'll do him and we can say dot padding 8.dp, put the 8.dp around there. And then inside the box, we're gonna put our movie display. So we're just gonna wrap it up there. And this movie list, let's call him, we'll just put him down at the bottom here. Movie list, movies equals movies. And let's put a, a little log for our movie list here. 
I'm not going to bother having him actually try to print out all the movies in a line like that. And let's see what this actually looks like when we run it. So it looks like we have the movie list being printed out okay here. When I click on something, you see it all gets swished down. I do have a little problem though because this isn't scrollable. So to make this whole thing scrollable, I really want the whole thing to be in one column and then tell it that that column's scrollable or have parts of it be scrollable. So maybe just the movie list itself we make scrollable. I can come in here and say modifier equals vertical scroll and we'll say remember scroll state. So remember scroll state is a little helper function that creates a slot inside the current node, puts an object that can keep track of the scroll state, and then uses that as the scroll state for the vertical scroll. That's mainly keeping track of where you've scrolled to. When I do that now, we'll see that this section at the bottom, I can now scroll up and down. If I click on something here, it moves it down, and now I can scroll it. And notice it's also going to keep, try to keep track of the position of where I'm scrolling even if the rest of the user interface changes. But let's take a look what happens when we try to change that list. Maybe we're gonna add an element to the list. Let's add an element at the top just so it's a little bit more easy to see what's going on here. Let's come up in here and when we do this, the sting, let's go ahead and add that movie to the list. So I'm gonna say movie list equals movie plus movie list. Actually, let's just add it on the end, that'll be easier. Well, let's see what it does here. The problem with the, uh, I just called it movies, didn't I? One of the problems with the, uh, the add operator here is if you say item plus list, that's not gonna work. List plus item will work just fine. So I really need to say, create a list of the first movie and then I can append it and that should work. What is the complaint about? Acquired movie, found movie question mark. Oh, because the existing movie is, it might be a null list. So, didn't I? Oh, because Oh, because movie is nullable. That's the problem there. So let's use a little trick in Kotlin here. Let's take this value and do an apply on it. So this is going to say I'm going to initialize a movie and pass it in as this to the body here and then return it. So it just does some initialization. So the extra initialization we're going to do here looks like that. And so what this is going to do is I create my movie. I'm going to init do some initial action right when it's created, passing it in as this, make it a list, concatenate with this other list, and now I've got my movies. So that should add the movie to the list. Let's do the same thing down here. And of course, I now that we have some common functionality here, I could even make another function to take care of this so it's the same functionality. Not going to bother right now, but we could. Let's try running it. Let's see what happens. Let's see if it's going to add in a movie at the top of the list each time. So the sting, boom, I see the sting added in, Superman, I see Superman added in, and now I have my whole list. But let's see what's happening as far as the refresh of all of this. Now, obviously, every time I add a movie to the list, I'm going to want to refresh it. But let's say that I, go, I comment out that add to the list thing for just a moment and see what happens when we just click these buttons to change what's at the top. Ideally, we shouldn't see the stuff down here need to get refreshed every single time. Let's take a look. If I come in here and I do that, and I'll just comment this guy out for the moment as well. Let's watch what happens on our log cat. So I'm going to run it, bring up my log cat. So we see we got my movie list is called up here. 
and let's clear the log cat. And if I click on the sting, note that movie list is called again. Even though I'm reusing the same tree guts behind the scenes, I'm reinitializing all that data every single time. That's not ideal because I, I should be able to just keep the same nodes that I had the previous time I rendered that movie list. Let's think about what's happening here for a minute. First of all, let's look at movie. Now Jetpack Compose can take a look at movie and infer that it's immutable because all of his fields are simple properties, strings in this case, that are themselves immutable. And I can't change them because they're listed as val. So Compose can infer that this thing will only uh, change if its dot equals has changed. Now I could explicitly list immutable on top of that to mark it as an immutable class, but in this case I didn't really need to. It inferred it. It was obviously doing the right thing and not always refreshing the movies all the time. For a list though, we have a little bit of a problem. Whenever you say you have a list of movies, a list of movies could also contain subclasses of movies. So there's no way for us to know if the subclass is actually going to be mutable or non-mutable. So what it does normally with a list is it infers, well, it can't infer that it can't change. And so it has to assume that anytime you have a list, it may have changed. And that puts us in a very uh, non-optimal situation. So one thing that you can do is we can create a wrapper for the movies that itself is marked as immutable if we know how we're using the data. So you have to be careful on this. If you know how you're using the data, you can do this. So let's try doing this. I'm going to create a class immutable list. And he is going to take a list inside of him. And I can just make this be generic. And we'll just say list T coming in there. So I can take any old object inside there. And I'm going to say that this guy implements list. So the overall thing is a list. But what I'd like to do is just delegate all the functionality of this list interface to the list inside of here. To do that, I can just say by list. Poof. One of the wonders of Kotlin, delegation by object. So we're passing an object in that we want to wrap. And then the interface that we implement, every single function in it is just getting delegated to that list internally. Now, what good is this? I might as well just use the list directly, right? Well, it's giving me a place to hang immutable. So I can put that immutable on there and Jetpack Compose will know that if I have an immutable list, I don't have to worry about the guts being changed because me, the programmer, is trying to promise to Compose that the data doesn't change in this list. So the whole list has to change, which is what we're doing when we say movies equals movies plus whatever. So let's take a look at how we can use this. First of all, we need to create an immutable list. So instead of having a list of here, let's create a little function. Let's take a look at the list of function. I'm going to copy his signature and paste him here. And I'm going to say immutable list of var arg elements. And this is going to return an immutable list equals list of elements. And, oh, but I, again, because uh, we have this var arg, I need to explicitly expand those elements. So I can say list of star elements to expand it. And just wrap it in an immutable list, just like that. And let's see, I think I need to say t colon any here. Looks like I actually didn't need to specify the upper bound on that, so I'm going to uh, do it like that. So what this does for me, this will create that little wrapper for us by just using the normal list of operator on all the elements. So it's going to create a normal list. And then I'm explicitly wrapping in this immutable list just so I can get this hand handle on it. Uh, and this is a little trick you're going to need to do in Jetpack Compose with lists if you want to take that extra step of optimization. You don't have to do it, but it really does help optimize things. So let's come down here and change this to be immutable list of. And so now movies is of type immutable list, which is good. 
So hopefully that'll help us when we're displaying things. But we do need to fix it when we add in these other items like this. We'll come back to that. These will actually be an error because I can't set list to this. I'm gonna have to have an immutable list and be able to add those together. So let's take a look at running this right now without actually changing the list and see what happens. So let's see what our log cat did here. I'm actually going to clear the log cat and then rerun it just so we can see the initial data nice and clean by itself. So we'll see that we have a lot of stuff called movie list was called up there, not being called again. I'm going to clear the log cat just so I can see where I am. And let's click the sting and see what happens. So movie list was called, why? Well, let's look at the definition of movie list. Where is movie list? There he is. Aha, we're still passing in the normal list. So compose wasn't able to optimize because we didn't tell it the right type yet. If I change that like that, now let's watch what happens. So once again, I'm gonna clear it. Let me rerun it just to make sure I have a nice clear state. So we saw movie list is called up here. Let's clear it again, push a button, and now look what happened. Movie list wasn't called. So by setting up your object to tell Jetpack Compose what's going on, he can do some optimization here and not have to rebuild that tree. Now it doesn't mean he's not repainting it on the screen, because obviously he has to repaint it. It's been moved to a different spot. But the actual structure behind the scenes doesn't have to be recomputed because we can reuse it. It says, hey, the data hasn't changed. I don't need to recompute the data. I don't need to recompute the tree part. Now that in itself is a little bit of an advanced concept in Jetpack Compose, because a lot of times you're not gonna notice that, but when you're trying to optimize your GUI, if you've noticed any type of sluggishness to it, you know, especially if you had inside that movie list if there was some heavy computation, You'd want to do something like this so that it can take advantage of optimizing that and not have to redefine all those nodes every single time. So in our next video, let's move on to actually creating a real user interface. We're going to use a lot of these concepts and we're going to add in a little bit along the, line, along the way. <clears throat> we're going to use a lot of these concepts and add some other things along the way.